Hello and welcome to the Royal Horticultural Society's Chelsea Flower Show 2022. It's been three years since we were at Chelsea in May and it's great to be back. Behind me, across the showground, there is excitement and just a small amount of pre-show nerves. From the first-timers to the experienced designers, everyone is frantically finishing final touches to make sure it all looks absolutely immaculate. This time we have 13 show gardens, 12 sanctuary gardens and an impressive 20 smaller designs ranging from balconies, containers and even houseplant studios. And that is not including all the incredible exhibits inside the Great Pavilion and the floristry installation. It's going to be a jam-packed week. Over the next few days, we will be exploring every inch of the showground. But this evening, we're starting with a sneak peek into all the wonderful things to look forward to. As always, we're joined by our incredible team of designers and plant specialists to guide you through everything. So let's take a look at what we've got in store. Carol Klein is back and she has got an exclusive first look around the floral fabulousness that is the Great Pavilion. Rachel Detame will be giving us her first impressions of the glorious gardens this year. And I'll be meeting up with actress and passionate gardener Caroline Quentin, who understands only too well those pre-show nerves that all the designers are facing this evening. But first, you may have noticed there is one part of the Chelsea package missing, my presenting partner in crime, Joe Swift. But if you look closely, just over there, I spy a very familiar Panama hat. There he is. Joe is here at Chelsea and he's doing a spot of gardening this year. Earlier this month, I joined him on the showground to see what he's been up to. Joe Swift, this is very confusing because this year you're actually designing a garden. I designed it two years ago, pre-COVID, this garden. But what's it like actually doing a garden now for the, what, the first time in 10 years? I'm not being judged, so I do feel like the pressure's off a little bit. It's an RHS exhibit. I'm going to try and enjoy this as much as possible. What have you got for us then? Well, it's all about bees and pollinators. Is that a bee's wing by any chance? That is a bee's wing. You know, I was looking for a shape, I was looking for Beautiful. something to hang a garden on. And it has to be wheelchair accessible as well, so people have to be able to get across here, be able to sit on the garden and hopefully be, be surrounded by buzzing bees. But you can see it shaping up. We've got the pond dug out. This is all the wings. Yeah, well, yeah. This, this is sort of a lot of paving, but there's also trees going within the paving. These are paving units. Mm -hmm. They've been made off site and they're going to be craned in, and then these are seating areas. So I've extruded these areas out. It's only here for a week, but it is going to live on after. It's going to go to a primary school yet to be named. Oh. So are you feeling the pressure yet? Not yet, no. At the moment, it's all going quite well. I think when the structure comes in, that's going to be stressful. The excitement and the pressure mounts. And even though I'm not being judged, obviously, you know, everyone's going to see it on the telly, all the visitors to the show, people like yourself. So there's always peer pressure. Well, I look forward to seeing, uh, seeing how whether you're still so relaxed in two weeks' time. I won't be. OK. <laughs> Feeling very relaxed in your garden already. I can tell. Just, in, you know, <laughs> just spread out a little bit, Sophie. Enjoy yourself. How's it going? It's exactly how I wanted it to look so far. It's quite a tricky plot, though, because in you know, most gardens here, you're viewing from outside only. Here, you've got, to, you're, you've got to be viewed from three sides, but then also from the inside. Because people are allowed to come on this garden, aren't they? So they're allowed to come on this garden. So from a design perspective, you've got to really think very three-dimensionally. That's a very squeaky barrow, isn't it? Yeah. Get some oil on that, mate. <laughs> But this garden's really all about the perennials and flowers, and it's going to be crazy colours. Is it? Yeah, I can't quite remember what I've ordered. <laughs> I've got a plant list as long as my arm, and it's going to be very, very energising, I hope. Um, and that's my oh, phone. That's, you can't have a phone I know, but it's that my deliveries, my bee houses. <laughs> I bet you. Sorry, I'm just going <laughs> to... Oh, there's a bit of a bee house turned up. Ah, 
they got Which coming? means Tom must be here. Oh, they're looking great. Does it give you a sort of taste to do a show garden again in the future? Yeah, potentially. Oh, does, I'm not getting any younger. I am coming to help you plant next week. OK, but you better behave yourself. Oh, oh I love it. Ow. I will be We're going to have them all week. <laughs> Right, Joe, last two, here you go. Lovely. Beautiful, aren't they? Can I they? climb in here without Come damaging you. anything? It looks amazing. It's just transformed, though, from last time I was here, and that was, what, five days ago? Yeah, I mean, it's all a bit smoke and mirrors, because everything's just been placed, and so which is sort of the fun bit. But now we've actually got to plant them, and some will come out of the pots, some will stay in the pots. Are you so. actually doing the planting yourself, or are you are you uh, orchestrating? I'm it? I, I love that word. <laughs> I'm orchestrating. I'm curating. Yeah. This is about mm. 2,000 perennials mm. in this garden. So it's quite intense, the planting and the tweaking. And I've still got some more coming tomorrow as well. Oh, look, a bee. <laughs> where, where? It's the bee garden. Build the bee. <laughs> it's yeah. absolutely full of bees. They, actually, the message has gone out that this garden <laughs> is for bees. Your return to the build, as it were, after what, nearly 10 years, what's it been like? Yeah. It's only been two weeks. It feels like I've been on site for two years. <laughs> but I'm really enjoying it. It's a creative process. And, you know, I was a landscaper when I first started, so I actually love the physical aspect of it as well. Well, the bees love it already. I think the public will love it. I want to see the water in there. I can't wait to see it when it's all finished, Joe. Here it is. The water, it's finished. It actually, Joe, it's spectacular. You're surprised, aren't you, Sophie? <laughs> you are shocked. I know, I'm really pleased with it, I have to say. Um, but it's for the bees. You know, it's trying to get the message across. We, we all think of oh, bumblebees and honeybees. They're the colony you know, forming bees. But actually, there's over 250 species of bees I in the UK. Some of them are so small, you can't even see them. They're tiny. And we can do so much in our gardens to help them out. You know, that's what these houses are for, isn't it? Yeah, the houses, there's holes drilled between two millimetres and 10 millimetres. They're very specific about where they'll create a house. There's some mud over there because a lot of them need mud to access to form their homes in as well. And then the water so that they can have a drink. I like what you've done with the pebbles. Yeah, the pebbles, well, I mean, they, they don't swim. They can't float. So it's some shallow water or pebbles with a little bit of shallow water so that they can drink from. And then just packing your garden full of, you know, nectar and pollen-rich plants from early... You know, January, February, right through to the autumn as well. This is a snapshot in time, of We were course. so excited when we saw the first bee, but, I mean, look at them. They are teeming everywhere. Thanks for and, bringing them. <laughs> I've got them here. And this week is going to be great because, actually, this is one of the few gardens that the public can come on. Yeah, and I'm really excited to see how they sit and sort of interact with the space and immerse themselves in the garden and watch the bees buzzing around. Um, I just hope they don't throw their, their sandwich wrappers in my pond. I'm sure they won't, Joe. Who would do anything like that? Well, I think it's... <laughs> wonderful it's come together beautifully in just three weeks you've got all these bees buzzing about but what about that helicopter have you seen the helicopter that keeps buzzing us all yeah all day? i kept hearing it. i think he's trying to get a sneaky peek of my <laughs> garden well joking aside i've seen plenty of showstoppers here at the rhs chelsea flower show 2022 an event supported by the newt in somerset check this out Designers at Chelsea are pulling out all the stops this year and really putting on a show. And of course, water is a big theme here. But at Chelsea, they do it like nowhere else. Now, this is Sarah Eberly's garden. And look at this. This is the most stunning water feature, one of the most stunning I've ever seen at Chelsea. It's an absolute triumph. What's interesting about it is the sound. You would expect it to be almost too powerful in a space this size, but actually it's mesmeric and there's something very calming about it. We have got 57,000 litres an hour being pumped up and round. Now that's about 100,000 pints of beer. Oh, sorry, it's Prosecco round here, isn't it? Well, this is exciting. This is the first time I've ever seen anything like this at Chelsea. This is a 15-tonne block of ice. It's been here since Friday. It's been covered up with insulation to keep it frozen. And now's the big reveal. And there we go, the block of ice revealed in all its glory. It's called the Plantsman's Ice Garden. It's designed by John Warland. He loves to explore different ideas. And here it's about permafrosts 
and how they contain seed banks. And as they melt, those seed banks are released and no seed can germinate. And they could be tens of thousands of years old. So during the show, this ice is gonna slowly melt. We're not sure exactly how long it's gonna take and it's gonna reveal a plant inside. So it's a really innovative use of water. It's silent, but it is slowly moving. And now we've got the most natural water feature in the whole of Chelsea. Now it looks so natural, but I think this is actually one of the hardest things to achieve. This is the Rewilding Britain Garden by Adam Hunt and Lulu Urquhart. And there are so many different forms of water as well. It starts with the beaver dam, which is sort of a murky water, and it clears as it comes down the stream. The sound of it, and the feel of it and the coolness of it is just genius. So there you go, we've got water in all different guises throughout Chelsea, from the dramatic to the very natural. Chelsea wouldn't be Chelsea without the Great Pavilion. And one lady who has had a sneak peek in here already is Carol Klein. Hello, Carol. Hello, Lovely isn't to see it? You. It's wonderful to be back, isn't it? The scent <laughs> of these roses is just, it hits you instantly, doesn't it? Yeah, and for me, it epitomises Chelsea, doesn't it? As soon as you walk through these doors, you know, it just, it's there. It's brilliant. It wasn't the same last September. There were hardly any roses here last year, were they? But this is their time, isn't it? Yeah, it is. They, they are the heart of Chelsea, really. And the colour is just out of this world, isn't it? That's what really, really hits you when you come into the pavilion, particularly this year, it is the colour. Yeah, well, I've, I've been very lucky because I've been having a look around specifically at colour, and this is what I found. It's wonderful to be back and to see this true Chelsea colour pervading the whole pavilion and in no place more so than on this scintillating stand. How about this for a novel idea? They've taken all the colours of these beautiful ornamental plants and used them in a little wild fire planting just beyond from this lovely dahlia dreamy nights with these rich magenta flowers and then a pale aversion, dreamy fantasy with soft corally coloured flowers punctuated everywhere with these great heads of alliums, tall stems of lupins and salvias adding this dainty touch. I think it's brilliant. I can hardly take my eyes off it. Well, Clement is a very colourful climate, but with them, that colour range is limited. Everything through white, pale blue, rich blues, deep purples, right through to lovely crimson like this Nubia. Often in our gardens, we're looking down at flowers, but clematis give us the opportunity to use our colours in a vertical way, climbing high up towards the sky. These are fuchsias, one of the most popular of our plants, not just because of the colour it provides, but also because of their habits, because here everything hangs downwards, the whole thing is pendulous, and you really feel, especially when they're displayed like this, that you can look up into them and drink in that glorious, glorious colour. It would make a very fine hat, don't you think? When's Ascot? Look at this glorious Antidesia. It's called Sonia, and no wonder. It's so vivid, you almost need your dark glasses. What Antidesia provide you with is these big blocks of really intense colour, from brilliant yellows, searing oranges, deep, rich purples, to palest pinks. Aren't they glorious? There's so much inspiring colour packed into the Great Pavilion. And throughout this week, I'm going to be telling you about ways that you can use colour in your garden. 
Well, the Great Pavilion isn't just the home to some of the finest nurseries and exhibitors in the world, it's also the showcase for some of the best floral designers in the country. And one of them is Simon Lysa. Florist extraordinaire. Lovely to see you here. Just explain what this is all about. So I'm very excited that I've been asked by the RHS to design their Platinum Jubilee to Her Majesty the Queen, who is, of course, the patron of the RHS. So we have 70 pots, one for each year of her reign, with the flower that she revealed to the RHS in 21 is her favourite, Lear the Valley. Beautiful, and it certainly smells gorgeous. And you've got people who've been working right up to the last minute to get this ready. Always, yes. <laughs> and so we've created a, a profile using all the trees, native English trees, gorgeous oak, some rosemary, which symbolises remembrance, which surrounds our ton of steel frame supporting the pots. Well, it's not finished, just let's make that clear. Very much like the floristry corner as well, which is still very much underway, isn't it? It's always pressured and it's exciting. We've got 14 competitors this year, which is more than ever, and they're, it's the roots of life, which is a celebration of the vitality of life, what we eat and how we breathe seen through the lens of floristry and floral art. And the people who are putting those together, unlike everybody, all the big people, the big gardens here on Main Avenue, they have so little time to get it all ready. They do. They're working sustainably, so their message is a fabulously environmentally friendly one, but so are the materials they're working with. So no floral foam, so everything is in water, so it doesn't last very long. And you've got more here, more exhibits here than you've had for quite some yes, time, haven't yes, you? Yes, yes, we have, which is really exciting, and they're all showcasing and flying the fab for fabulous British florist. Tree. And I think this, when it's finished with its 70 pots, is going to be really striking, isn't it? Yeah, it's a spectacular location and I am thrilled and delighted to have been asked to create it. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful if the Queen were able to see it as well? Fingers, Fingers crossed. Who knows? You well, never know. Good luck, Simon. Thank it's you. Fantastic. This year feels like the start of changing fashions at Chelsea with the return of some more traditional garden designs, ones that you can perhaps imagine in your own space at home. And this is one of them. It's the Morrison Co Garden designed by Ruth Wilmot. Just a few weeks ago, we caught up with Ruth to find out the inspiration behind her garden. My name is Ruth Wilmot, and this year at Chelsea Flower Show, I'm designing my first big garden on Main Avenue, inspired by the work of William Morris, the great designer of the 19th century. In 1861, William Morris founded what is now known today as Morrison Co., the interior design company. He was also known as the father of the arts and crafts movement. This was a, a counterpoint to the industrialization and the factories that were being created and the mass production that went on. And it was about coming back to smaller craft workshops. So we've come to Kelmscott Manor for inspiration because this is where Morris spent about 25 years of his life. What was special about Morris's designs is that his love of the natural world, he brought into the interiors of people's homes, he brought the outside in, but he also had a view on the outside and the garden environment, that the garden should be an extension of the home, like a, like a room outside. Right here in this space, we're seeing a really good example of an arts and crafts uh, garden because it's surrounded by the yew hedging on one side. It's proportionate to the house. We've got lots of greenery, natural materials in the pathway and the walls. It's just a lovely example of a garden room. I can see the rich layers that Morris would have had, the botanical layers in his uh, patterns and designs. And I love this statuesque globe artichoke. It's just a lovely mix of foliage and flowers. William Morris believed very much in both form and function. And we've tried to bring that uh, into our garden through a garden that is a space where you can sit and enjoy it, but it's also a habitat for birds and other wildlife and at the same time, it is aesthetically beautiful. So as part of the research for the garden, Morris & Co allowed us unique access to their very special archive. I cannot believe that, that I'm looking at things that are 150 years old. And this original pattern book, it's just beautiful. 
It's a very fragile book, but it is wonderful that these patterns have survived. The colours are just extraordinarily vibrant. We've started with the trellis pattern, which I know was his first design. The trellis was designed in 1862, so very early on. We've used that as the basis of the layout of the garden because it just translates so beautifully into the interconnecting pathways. The other one that we've picked up on that you've got out is the beautiful willow boughs print. And I can see the printing blocks there. We took the idea of the metal inlays to showcase more of the contemporary style of craft work and craftsmanship that goes on to create this um, metal pavilion. So we have the bird motif in here, which we're bringing into our garden. Inspired by Morris looking at the gardens here at Kelmscott Manor, and being charmed by the thrushes, unlike the gardener who was not charmed <laughs> by them at all because they were stealing the strawberries. I've got some lovely little wild strawberries here. So we are slightly worried about the strawberries because we're not sure whether they're going to be um, fruiting for the show. The head gardener very kindly uh, lifted some for us to take to the show to put in the garden. Willow, I'm using this in the garden. I can really see why Morris did a whole pattern, in fact, two patterns dedicated to willow foliage, because it's certainly one of my favorites. So what I'm hoping is that lovely idea that Morris took huge inspiration from nature and outdoors and observing everything, and he brought it into, into the interior. And what we're doing is we're taking that same inspiration from his interior ideas and patterns and taking it full circle back out into a garden and reimagining it. And here we are, and it looks absolutely stunning. But when you know the narrative behind it, it just adds an extra layer of interest, doesn't it? And here at the back, we've got this pavilion, and it's gorgeous. This is in dragon's blood, as William Morris would have called it. It's a great colour. And we've got the willow boughs pattern, which create a beautiful dapple shade beneath, a really lovely seating area on a hot day like this. And then the trellis pattern is laid on a diagonal through the garden, which creates a really lovely movement and interest as you walk through. We've got the water just rippling over here, just creating a nice little bit of movement. And then the planting is sort of quintessentially English cottage style. I had a bit of tree envy when this wonderful hawthorn was being craned in a couple of weeks ago. And the verbascum, this verbascum petra, picks up again on the colour of the pavilion and it's dotted through the garden. There are bees all over it. Ruth, are you pleased with this garden? I mean, it's your first time doing a large show garden on Main Avenue. How do you feel? I'm absolutely delighted. I, I love it. We've had such a good time building it. Is it exactly how you imagined it to be? It's certainly the way we intended the brief to be and the colours. We've been really lucky with all the plants and the colours, yes. So I'm glad you like the Vabascan Petra. Yeah, I like the, I love the Vabascan Petra. Yeah. yeah, but could you send some of the bees down to my garden <laughs> no, a bit later? <laughs> yeah, they're all over it. I mean, this is a lovely hawthorn too. Yeah. What about the strawberries? Did the strawberries make it? The strawberries have made it. They're there at the front for everyone to see at the show. Um, the lovely head gardener Celia at Kelmscott Manor grew those for us and yeah. they're taking pride of place at the front. Yeah, I just, I, you know, I really love the water because you can just hear a tiny little bit of trickle, but it's yeah. more just that sort of, on a hot day like this, that, that glistening. Yes, the cooling and the effect is, we wanted it to, uh, the, the water to just ripple and glisten over the pattern of the willow bears. Behind the pavilion, actually, there's much wilder area, isn't there? there yeah. there's, there's the willow and it's much wilder style yes. of planting. Yes. Which uh, is, is great for nature and, and yeah. wildlife. And birds in particular. So Morris had a recurring motif of birds in his patterns. Yeah. And we wanted to create habitats for birds. So with the hedging and all the trees, and particularly the wilder area at the back. So we've had blue tits come and visit us and blackbirds and obviously the robin. Fantastic. So it's a garden for people, it's a garden for wildlife, yes. it's a garden for the visitors. Thank you, Ruth, you've done a great job. Thank Enjoy you. the show. Thank you, Joe. Away from the show gardens on Main Avenue, you'll find Ranelagh Gardens, which is home to these bijou and beautiful 
house plant studios. And look who is here. It's Arit. <laughs> Hello, Arit. Hello, good to now, see you. This is only the second time they have come to Chelsea, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Um, they debuted in the September show um, in 2021, and I am really, really glad to see them back. They were such a hit. There are lots of these studios along here, and what's wonderful is there really is something for everyone at Chelsea, isn't there? Oh, absolutely. And as I discovered earlier, there are container gardens, balcony gardens, and it goes to show that Chelsea, even if you are short of space, we've got you covered. <laughs> Come this way. We're going to a party, a plant party. And look at this, inspired by the iconic Studio 54. This is a homage to plant disco. Of course, the glitter ball is here, but it certainly isn't centre stage. This place is packed for the plants. From the retro Sansevieria, there's wild and wacky cacti over here, and even fungi. I love that. But you've got to keep on point and mix it in with a lava lamp too. But in here, forget the washing up. This is where it's at. Turn your sink into a small indoor pond for the aquatics and get back to the dance floor. This garden is calm and secluded and designed to be in a high-rise tower for a single city dweller in London. It's wonderful to actually be immersed in all the plants, have them so close, having nature really in my face. But it's designed to be a meditative space. Even the use of colour has been introduced to reflect nature. The blue of the sky or this lovely ochre colour could be a beach scene. These plants have been specifically chosen for the harsh conditions that you find on a high-rise balcony. They may be robust, but they still look fantastic and they are evergreen for most of the year. There's a huge variety of plants here that are given texture and form, although little flower colour, that doesn't matter because the walls and the containers will give colour interest all year round. There really is no space too small for peace and solitude. Courtyard gardens may be small spaces, but they certainly don't have to lack imagination. And I love what's been done with this one. Containers are a fantastic way to pack a punch in a small space. These recycled whiskey barrels are repeated across the space. This real large one at the back here, being able to hold a tree. And these ones over here have got ericaceous soil. That's an acid soil, so that you can put different plants throughout your borders. And look at these. These gin distillery pots have been repurposed to make a wonderful collection of plants and also a water feature. And I really like the fact that the shininess of the copper will bounce light around the garden as well, adding to its interest. A small space with a lot of imagination can certainly deliver a very big impact. Well, that's proof that gardening and Chelsea is for everyone, no matter what space you've got at home. Still to come, from beautiful blooms to inspirational gardens. New design trends and special guests. But first, Sophie is catching up with a familiar face on Main Avenue, taking a look around another show garden. This is the Older Hay Garden, designed by brothers Howard and Hugh Miller. And it is all about children. It is for children. It's all about discovering, connecting with nature, mental, physical health. And here to discover it, Toby Buckland. It's no, gorgeous, isn't it? Well, it's a triumph, isn't it? Yeah, it's, a, it's part of a theme, I think, with Chelsea Gardens, that they're, they're changing from designs to impress or possibly scare the neighbours <laughs> into, into gardens that give something back that you interact with. I love this in itself. I mean, 
it's a sort of path, but it's not a, either. It's a sort of undulating, they call it the picnic blanket. I mean, that's what it's supposed to be, it's an edible blanket. Um, good horticulture here as well, because you could walk amongst these plants, you could pick them, the children could be in on the oregano, in on the parsley, in on the sorrel, learn what they are, but without doing them any harm. And I think the design overall, including the edible hedges, the nuts in them, it's got a certain amount of mischief. It, it sort of scruffles the hair of gardening convention, if you like, which all the best children's designs do. I think this helicopter up there wants to have a look at what we're looking at. <laughs> That's how good it is. Um, this garden has got all kinds of little corners to discover, little crannies, nooks yeah. and crannies. You'd love that as a kid, wouldn't you? Well, secret gardens, I mean, it's so appealing to children, aren't they? A little place you can make your own. Wonderful. And I think when you come on here, you just you have to cross this bridge. It's wonderful. <laughs> it just is so inviting. And over here, come along over here, you get uh, all these array of pickles and things that you can make using produce from the garden. And I love this because it looks Ooh. like it looks like a fancy wheelbarrow. Yeah. On top of it, I'm going to show you this first of all. This is for children. If you want to get to a branch, you're a bit small. Oh, I see. See? It's a branch, a branch hooker. Yeah. So you can get your stuff off the trees. <laughs> and then have a look inside here. It's great. It's oh, a wheelbarrow with cups. <laughs> Do you know, this, we could go around the showground <laughs> a bit later on. We could sell our own donuts, we Sophie. Could, we could do all kinds of it. Can you imagine? Good sales. Look, it's even, it's even got a little sieve in there and down here, and it gets very sophisticated towards this end. It's got a cooker, Ooh. a stove. You can make some tea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing, I think. This is a children's garden that's been upworked, hasn't it? The design element comes through in everything. Every single detail has been thought about, and so beautifully beautifully and artfully crafted. I think what I love about it is actually you discover it the moment you step onto it. You yeah. really get a sense it unfolds before you. Well, and also it sort of speaks of the past, but it's not a postcard from another year. This is kind of the, the things from many people's childhoods, the visits to the countryside, the, I don't know, picking flowers from your grand's garden. It's got all of that, but in a kind of contemporary setting. Well, that helicopter has been sort of slightly spoiling our rural tranquillity, but it can't spoil the quality of this beautiful well, garden. You, you always say, bring the children, bring the noise, Sophie, don't you? That's Very it. Very true. Very true. I like, I like it. Good thought. Well, it's such a gorgeous garden, and it is really great to get a first look. We will be chatting to the designers later in the week. Now, this year sees the launch of a new initiative at Chelsea called Project Giving Back. And it's the brainchild of two philanthropists keen to support a wide range of charitable organisations adversely affected by the pandemic. Working with the RHS, 12 charities and community interest groups have received funding from Project Giving Back and have been paired with designers to create show gardens that will highlight the work of these good causes. Adam Frost has been to meet the designers of one of these gardens and find out why they're keen to make the most of this huge opportunity for their community initiative, Grow to Know. Oh, look at you two looking busy. Didn't realise you two actually gardened. All I've ever seen you is talking about. Uh, well, <laughs> we'd like to put on a show for you today. Bless you. So is this one of your community gardens? Yeah, so this is, this is basically my back garden. Tation, how did you get into gardening, mate? You didn't come in in the conventional ways. Ah. My way into gardening was in a response to, to the Grand Foot Tower fire. Gardening saved me at that point. I got into it, in a way, in a sense, by default, really. I was in sales, and I just got this random phone call from this lady who heard a rumour that I enjoyed gardening. Right. I went to see her, and this lady was just so infectious. During that time, people approached me and asked if I would come and do their gardens. Yeah. That side of things built up, and then that's when I had to make that choice, and for me it was a no-brainer. What was that first connection with you guys in, in Chelsea? For me it was about education, really. I just wanted to go and see the show gardens and learn more and more as a garden designer. I have to say that um, I was well aware that it, uh, from the start, that it's not very diverse. It just seemed to be a certain type of person walking around the show. It's interesting, because I can remember the first time, you know, that I was actually you know, starting to design and yeah, I, I didn't feel like I should be there and that was on a social level, you know, working class kid at the yeah, Chelsea yeah. Flower Show. Well, for me as a local boy, I had no clue. I'd only come to the forefront, you know, in my experience in meeting people like uh, Danny and people in the gardening world that it, I've come to understand that Chelsea Flower Show is a pretty big thing. Um, and I think it, it can be used as a platform um, to, do, to do good. And this I'm factually wrong here. You two have never done a show garden. No. Nope. Anything nope. like it? Nope. 
Where have you two got the inspiration from? Shall we go in? We might as well. You. Yeah? Yeah. Come on. Come on then. Why are we here? This is a place of real importance. This is where Frank Critchlow in 1968 first opened his doors uh, to the Mangrove, uh, which was a Caribbean restaurant. You know, it doesn't matter what your background, your colour, your race, everybody was welcome here. This is not just a restaurant, is it? It turned into being a lot bigger than, than Frank ever thought it was. It did, only because the police raided this place over and over again, under the pretext that there were drugs in here. There weren't any drugs in here. So it was in 1970 where nine community members who then came to be known as the Mangrove Nine led a protest against uh, the police brutality at the Mangrove. And there was about 150 community members that joined them. And it was a peaceful protest and the police started to get aggressive towards the people who were on the march. The police took the occupants of this place to court yeah. under pretext that they were inciting a riot and there was a landmark court case which became known as the Mangrove Nine, which they actually won. And they showed up the judicial system and the police, what they were, uh, racist. That's a fascinating story. I want to understand now how you turn that into design. This garden is here to make a statement, kind of bring to light um, the stark realities of social injustice and environmental injustice through, through what is, um, will be a four and a half metre tall sculpture. So yeah. each root on this, on this mangrove tree represents each member of the Mangrove Nine and it creates this protective kind of sheltered sanctuary beneath it. Yeah. And so you're protected by the mangrove. Um, and you know, mangroves in their natural habitat are ecosystem exactly. engineers. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, this is encouraging people of all backgrounds and, and community members to congregate and unify under the mangrove. What sort of planting, what's the representation in there? What's it about? Well, actually, a lot of the plantings chosen are to thrive in inner city gardens. So Chelsea Flower Show is, is a stopping off point for this garden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so these plants were all to be relocated into the community of North Kensington. For me, it's all about legacy. And, you know, we're honouring the mangrove nine yeah. in this garden. And what better way to honour them, you know, with a, a garden that will educate you know, the young people in the area, every time someone interacts with that garden, they know and are, are learning about the mangrove nine and the deforestation of mangrove forest. What those guys are talking about, racial, social, environmental injustice, the Chelsea Flower Show, I think, is a great place to go and shout about exactly that sort of stuff. So I wish them loads of luck. As you walk into this garden, the first word that comes to mind is safe. This wonderful sculpture seems to embrace you. Look a bit closer and the boulders create this wonderful community space. And it just says, sit down, take a moment. And then when you sit, it's lovely because the sculpture pulls your attention down into the planting, over there into the water which is wonderfully calm and reflective. And the plant in itself <laughs> plays an incredible amount of flower shapes. It feels luxurious. And I love this bounce between that luxurious feel and then the urban touch. The old fence at the back there talks to the arbor. It's interesting though, they haven't just stopped with the ornamentals. They've interplanted with the edibles. And you get the sense that, you know, you could sit here and just really enjoy maybe picking the odd thing and sharing it around. I think the lads wanted to create a garden that was going to pull in community. And I think they've nailed it. How is it that you two have just done a Chelsea build and you still look that good? <laughs> I don't know, you might Do be you... talking about him rather than me. You Looks not... can be deceiving. I don't know about that. <laughs> so. Have you achieved what you wanted to achieve? I think so, don't you? Yeah, I mean, 
it was always about the bigger picture here. This is this garden representing more than what was in the Chelsea Flower Show walls. Um, and I'd like to think that we've um, created a few ripples. Um, and I definitely know that my, the people in my community are really excited to, to see this garden. And I suppose talking about communities, anybody actually come into the show? Yeah, so next, I think next week we've got uh, over 100 community members coming into, into Chelsea Flower Show. That's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, it is fantastic. Yeah. Maybe, is there a little few butterflies about the judging? Always butterflies for me. I mean, he's very calm, but I'm a little <laughs> bit uptight, I have to say. But the way I cover it up is by smiling all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Can I be really honest with you? Yeah, go on then. Be honest. Hit us where it hurts. No, I think you'll be all right. <laughs> oh, cheers. <laughs> oh, that's a relief. <laughs>sanctuary is exactly how I describe this design by Tony Woods. It's so immersive. You really feel that you're in amongst the planting. And the idea is that you're taking your daily commute to your home office through the garden. And the scene is really set by these wonderful Betula nigra with their peeling bark and just that very delicate foliage. I particularly like this sweep of planting. You've got flocks just releasing that perfume into the air. They love the opium poppy in that really dark sort of crushed black currant colour. And also caught my eye is the honesty. At the moment, it's got these bright green seed heads. And of course, through the summer, those are going to dry and become more transparent. Who wouldn't enjoy a daily commute through a garden like this? Frederick White's garden celebrates fine cell work, who aim to help prisoners produce beautiful quality needlework. In the structure, for example, you've got these wonderful woven willow panels just set into them. And then the willow is followed through there with living willow. This is pollarded, so you get this wonderful, mad, multi-stemmed effect. And then all around it, we've got a veritable tapestry of beautiful underplanting, lots of gorgeous perennials. I'm particularly drawn to this corner here, which just has a lovely peony called Coral Charm. And then the Aquilegia, that pale, soft, buttery yellow coming through. To me, it looks like a Battenberg cake in planting form. The whole thing is utterly delicious. I immediately feel this wonderful sense of warmth and calm here at Tom Hoblin's beautiful garden, which takes you on a global journey. There's this wonderful cornice controversa here at the front of the garden, really dominating the space. And then underneath it, a beautiful sort of textural carpet. So you've got the contrast, for example, in the size and shape of the hosta leaves, and then that beautiful soft, froth of the ferns and through it all there's upright spikes of the iris sibirica with that lovely mauve blue flower at the top. I just think that with that journey that you take through this garden on that lovely sinuous path with the water rill you get the most incredible atmosphere here. It's such a beautiful garden and I think it shows like all the sanctuary gardens just how much you can achieve with planting combinations in a space that we can all relate to. 
Well, every year, Chelsea is a highlight of the social season. And when the show opens tomorrow, celebrities and royalty will flock to see the new gardens and exhibits here. But my guest today has had a very special early glimpse before anyone else. Welcome, Caroline Quentin. Thank you very much. And I have indeed had a sort of public-free um, look at the gardens, and that's been extraordinary. It's, a, it's an amazing day, actually, the day before Chelsea actually opens its doors. It does feel a real privilege to be here because all the people who've designed the gardens and worked on them are still, lots of them are still here. And you see the work that's gone into them. There are still people um, putting the finishing touches. You can sort of feel the nerves a bit as well. It feels a bit like being backstage on the first night. You say hello to people and you talk to them, but you know they're not really with you. They're actually finishing off their garden or deciding whether or not the planting's absolutely right. And I, it kind of that sense of anticipation is... Um, it's, it's exciting to see. It is, it is a big stage. It's a big performance here, isn't it? I mean, this garden is, is stunning, isn't it? It's a Swiss it. sanctuary, this one. I with love that, it. That water. How it's inviting. Brilliant. It's beautiful. And also, it is so inviting. <laughs> it's so hot today and it's so clear. And then you've got this wonderful... The thrift and all these little alpines around it and then the pine tree next to it. And you just think... If I just, if I turn my back on everybody out there, I could pretend I was up a mountain by a mountain pool. But that's the magic of it, isn't yeah. it? That's what yeah. they create in just three weeks. And you've been looking at some of the other gardens. What's, what's struck you? Um, I've been uh, concentrating mostly on what are called the sanctuary gardens. They're, they're small gardens, perfectly formed small gardens. Um, a lot of them have... Um, one of them is about the circle of life, another is about regeneration, the body shop garden is about regeneration, about, in fact, uses the eucalyptus as a sort of means of storytelling um, through, through the planting and through that. And it's, I, I, I fell in love with that garden because it's, um, it's got core 10 in it, which is a, something I really love. And, and the planting has been matched so brilliantly with GM and irises and verbascum, all of my favourite plants. So um, I've been looking at those little perfectly formed gardens. And you really do know your stuff. I mean, you are such a keen gardener. Tell us about your incredible place that you have in Devon, because you started off with no garden there at all and you have transformed it. Yeah, it's, um, um, it's a farmhouse. Um, it had been a ploughed field, um, pretty much derelict, quite a lot of farm machinery left in it. And we, we put a huge body of water in and I grow all my own veg vegetables there. I mean, I, people have sort of come to know me um, through CQ Gardens, which is my Instagram account. And I show people really how, not only how to grow veg, but how to have stress-free growing of veg and also how to cook what they're growing. And I think more and more of us, because of the um, pandemic, are suddenly realising the value of even tiny spaces, window boxes, mm. Uh, little things on window ledges. You can grow all sorts of things. And, I mean, as you say, I, I've been a passionate gardener for a oh, long time, <laughs> 35, 40 years maybe. But I'm now finding that a lot of people are starting to discover an affinity with plants which they've never had before. But it's your peace, isn't it? It's your sanctuary. Yeah, I think, you know, and I also think they're discovering more and more of the mental health is helped hugely by being outside the butterflies go past, as if, as if Disney were in charge of this set. Um, but, but, we, but, but we are discovering that mental health is closely linked to time spent outside, to time spent you know, with your hands in the dirt, with growing things, with the joy of planting a seed and watching it turn into uh, whatever, a tomato, a, 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 a lettuce, or, or, you know, or some roses, or some uh, rhododendrons. It's... it's it is good for mental health, it's good for physical health being outside and working hard outside. And I, I think, actually, increasingly, we're going to find that our links to gardens are going to save us. Well, Caroline, lovely to see you here. You. And uh, my only question is, are we going to jump in now? Oh, I am! <laughs> <laughs> I, I am, Sophie, are you? I think I'll have to. OK. <laughs> Chelsea Flower Show is well known as the pinnacle of the horticultural world. So it's a great place for communities and societies to come together to showcase their best displays. And that's exactly what the members of the Irish Society have done to celebrate a very special birthday. I'm Jill Whitehead. I'm British Irish Society Secretary and have been for a good number of years. My main role really is to encourage members and get them involved in the society. Today we're celebrating the centenary of the British Irish Society which was set up in October 1922 
Uh, the reason for having a centenary celebration is one doesn't get to be a hundred very often. Everything's beginning to come together. It's, uh, it's always a little bit worrying when you first come. The main worry really is, will we have any blues? I think generally we've got good show. I'm Sydney. I'm one of the longest serving members of the Irish Society. I'm Jake and I'm one of the youngest members of the Society. I joined the Irish Society in 1952. For my wedding anniversary, my wife gave me a life membership. I love Irises because you can get Irises in flowers throughout the year. I've been in the Society, I think, for four years now. I really like the flowers because uh, I'm colour blind and they come in so many different colours. Uh, even I can see <laughs> most of them. My name is Fern Harden and I'm the botanical artist for the British Irish Society. They inspire me because the colours are so vibrant and the texture of the petals often are quite velvety and so to try and accomplish that in a painting is quite difficult. I have a special iris named after me and today I've managed to paint it and bring it along to the show. We're in a bit of a rush now and the judges will be around in about 10 minutes. Cold weather has kept the buds frozen and then just they've suddenly popped in the last two days. That's the tradition, you always top it up with moss. A lot of our members that enjoy uh, competing in the shows, as you can see here today, they've all entered. My name's Chris Towers, I'm on the uh, Iris Committee, but I'm also uh, the, the chairman of the judging panel today. I think most of us yeah. would feel that one was the better one. So here we have a bearded Iris. And it's called bearded because you see the orange beard on, on the flower. And here we have the fall. We have three falls, which is good. And we have petals that uh, point upwards are called standards. This is nice because we don't like the flowers to be too crowded together. Right, I got uh, first prize for this one. Oh, I'm very happy with it. Um, it can be a bit embarrassing because the others are quite good as well. We've had a, a really good show today. It's been a, a difficult season to grow irises, but the standard that we've had today is, is really good. At Chelsea this year, there's four of us that are doing the main exhibiting. Myself, Fern Harden, Rex Harden and Anne Milner. But of course, we've been supported by a great number of members who've not only bred the irises, but doing a lot more for us. No, I'm not the boss. We're a team effort. The four of us are a great team. When we meet, we discuss who can do this, and one of us is like, oh, I can do that bit. And that's how it's worked, really. We occasionally have warm discussions, but uh, <laughs> that's what generally we're speaking, for. it's amicable arrangements that are made. The irises we're displaying at Chelsea are all British-bred irises grown over the last hundred years to coincide with the centenary of the society. We also try to choose irises which have got awards over the years, so that they've got a Dykes Medal, because that's the highest award that you can achieve in the iris world. It's filling of total trepidation as well as the excitement and honour of being there. I think we all feel that it's uh, very special to be representing the Irish Society at Chelsea. After all, it's five for a hundred years and we hope that we're doing a little bit to celebrate that and perhaps also to encourage it to do another hundred years. It always amazes me how much work goes into one of these exhibits behind the scenes, but they've obviously had a lot of fun along the way too. Now here we have some beautiful iris, and these are all bred in the last 100 years in the UK, a kaleidoscope of colours. And at the back there we have Fern Harden, named after Fern herself, and it's absolutely stunning. A dusky pink with a very prominent orange beard. It's really gorgeous. And next to it, a really available one. You get it in most garden centres, and you'll see a lot of it in the gardens out here. Designers love to use it. Kent Pride, a sort of mahogany colour with a fall with a lovely yellow beard on that. And I often get asked, you know, my iris aren't flowering properly, what do I do about it? It's usually because the rhizome is not getting baked in the sun. There might be perennials and grasses blocking them out. So make sure they're nice and clear at the base, nothing blocking the sun, and that those rhizomes are getting plenty of sun and heat. 
And the most romantic gesture I've ever done is to name an artist after my wife, Cathy Swift. Well, we're going to come back later in the week and see how these guys got on. But for now, it's an absolute stunner. The Chelsea Flower Show is a unique platform, not just for great design and great plants, but also a fitting place to honour and remember significant moments in our nation's history, like this one, the RAF Benevolent Fund Garden in commemoration of the Battle of Britain. And I'm with the designer, John Everest. John, lovely to see you. And this is just spectacular. It really stands out here in the showground. Tell us the story behind it. Well, my father was in the RAF during the war in Bomber Command and I've been brought up with all the stories um, of what they did and, and what all his uh, comrades did. And I got asked to do something about the Battle of Britain, which is a fantastic honour. Uh, and I wanted to create something that was eye-catching, that could be viewed from a distance and could retell the story in, in a modern way. Because I'm very passionate about young people um, drawn into the stories from the past. It's definitely eye-catching, and it's a pilot looking up to the skies. And what I love is you've got your son, George, who's only in his early 20s, to model, didn't you? Wearing even your father's watch. Yes, my, my father's service watch, which we still have in the family. Um, he actually buried this when he got shot down in 1943. Went back in 1947 and dug it up, and it still worked, and he's wearing it now. So it's a great way of linking my son to his grandfather, somebody he never met but sort of, I feel like it's sort of bringing them together. What I love about it, though, as well, is different angles where you stand. It changes the perspective, doesn't it? But also the way you can see it, because the legs are, are almost ghostly, but you've got a really solid bit of, I suppose, history up there, and you know it's from the past, just looking at the legs. Yeah, I mean, you, when you design sculpture, you never know really how successful it's going to be in real life, but this has been fantastic, and the reaction's been great. I mean, it weighs seven tonnes, but it has a quite um, light feel to it. You've been very successful with other projects you did in 2019, uh, a wonderful sculpture that's in, northern, in France for the commemoration of the D-Day landings. That's right. Um, the, we relocated the whole guard from Chelsea in five days in time for the 75th anniversary. And we've had over a million visitors over the last four years to the site. So, yeah, the, these projects can be amazing and draw new people to the story. And this one, too, will be relocated, won't it? That's right. All going to Biggin Hill. Um, the entire garden, you will see it's part of a, a much larger garden that surrounds it. Um, it's going to be free to access and it's going to form part of the history trail for the whole Biggin Hill site. Wonderful. John, lovely to see you and a fantastic sculpture that you brought here to Chelsea. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Sophie. Well, what a great start. The show is packed this year. I have not seen this many gardens for ages. No, it's looking fantastic. It is just wonderful to be back here on the showground and soaking it all in again. I love it. <laughs> and, of course, we want to hear what you all think too. So let us know and follow us on Twitter at GW and Shows using the hashtag BBC Chelsea and find us on Facebook at BBC Garden as well. Our coverage continues tomorrow at 3.45 on BBC One with Nikki Chapman and Angelica Bell who will be bringing you all the action when the show opens as celebrities and the world's press get their first look at the show. And then I'll be here with Monty on BBC Two at 8 p.m. when we'll be getting an in-depth look into more of the gardens and designs at the RHS Chelsea Flower Show, an event supported by The News. Until then, goodbye. Bye-bye.